God has spoken and it is relevant. There's nothing more relevant than the gospel. What I mean when I think about that is that every one of us has a need for some good news. Especially the good news that our sins can be forgiven and that we can cross over from death into life. That is relevant to every person on the planet. Every detail of the Word of God is relevant to us as it points us toward Him and toward His will and tells us about His love for us and His will for us. But that central message of good news, that God cares about us even though we have been sinful and He has provided a way for us to be forgiven, is relevant to every person, from the youngest person who's thinking already about heaven to the oldest person who's thinking about heaven, it is relevant to us. I want us to focus on that central relevant message this morning as we think about just how powerful the Word of God is in our lives. But I want to I do that by challenging us in the way that we think. It's, it's easy to drift into worldly thinking, and we don't want to do that. We probably think this way more than we realize that we do. And this is my, I apologize, I'm kind of a math person, and if you don't do bar graphs, then we'll wake you up in a few minutes, okay? So this is a really clunky way of doing it, but just hear me out. This is my parable, all right? We tend to think of people as being some bad folks out there, and then pretty average good folks, and then uh, we have some really great folks, and we call them the salt of the earth. Does that expression mean anything down here? The salt of the earth, those best people. And you have some of those in your congregation here, don't you? Those people that are over there on the right, you think of them as just the best folks. They're probably your grandparents and some of your elders and their wives and, and folks that you just look up to because they do so well. Their faith is strong. They're gracious. They have a habit of obedience in their life. They are joyful and worshipful. And we think of just those best people. But we don't imagine that they're perfect, but we think they're very close. And then we tend to think of ourselves, perhaps, not everyone does this. Almost no one thinks of themselves as being absolutely the best, but we maybe tend to think of ourselves as being pretty good people. We think of ourselves as pretty good folks, and in fact, uh, it's uh, always interesting at, at funerals. I've never been to a funeral, participated in a funeral, but what that person was a good person. Right? At least that was the talk. Now, I don't know what everybody said when they got in their car and left, but... While they're in the funeral home, oh, he was good. He and the Lord, boy, they were close, right? And the people tend to think of themselves as good and, and uh, sort of average, but we don't think of ourselves as making an, an A. I'm a teacher, okay? Pardon me. Over here, in the, this guy, these folks over here, they're making at least a 92, 93 over here on the right. They're making an A. And we think of ourselves as maybe making a B minus when it comes to being good. Most of the people I talk to at least sort of seem to feel that way. And then we look at other people, and uh, sometimes we call them heathen people, or just ungodly people, or uh, people from Alabama. It's all the same <laughs> people. And we look at those people and we say, now they're bad. right? I'm, you can look at that person, and I don't have their record. And this is all a lie. That doesn't sound right, does it? What's wrong with this model? Here's what's wrong with it. We're comparing ourselves to other human beings. We're comparing ourselves to each other and we're judging other people and we're judging ourselves based on looking at other people. You see, here we set up as a standard a person, a human being. That person we look at, we say, boy, that's our standard over there. They're, they're almost at 100% good and we set them up as our standard. No human being is our standard for absolute good. God is our standard. In fact, we get our word good from God. Just take that short O and make it long. We serve a good God. Jesus says there is one good, and that's God. So I, I got to thinking about this in my mathematical mind, and I said, well, how much better is God than the best person I know? How much less has God sinned than the best person I know? How much more good has God done than the best person I know? How many more times has God forgiven 
than I have forgiven? How many more times has God given to the poor than I have given to the poor? How much more has God endured for the sake of love than I have been willing to endure? Well, it's without measure, isn't it? But just for the sake of argument and illustration this morning, let's just say that God is ten times better than the best person you know. And I know you're going to say, oh, it's more than it's a hundred, it's a thousand, it's a million, it's infinite. But just for the sake of illustration, let's say God is ten times better than the best person you know, and let's make Him our standard, all right? And so we're going to add one more column on this chart, and we're going to put God on there. We're going to keep everybody else doing the same good they're doing, but now we're going to put it in relation to God. Uh-oh. Now that's the truth. I know it's the truth. We just read it this morning. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now look at this chart for just a minute. Do you see the short? All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Of God, And he didn't even just say the goodness of God. Paul said the glory of God. Because it is on a different scale really than what we think of as human goodness. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now this has a, a leveling effect. I think that's why Paul's talking about it in Romans 3.23. Romans 3, really he's talking about Jews and Gentiles. Christians who were having trouble accepting each other. The Jews thought they had a better pedigree of godliness thought they were more righteous because of having had the law for generations and having been circumcised and having kept the Sabbath and done all of that. And Paul says, nope, that's not the way it works. He says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter who you are. And he wants to level the playing field. And I tell you, that levels it pretty much, doesn't it? The best person I know and the worst person I know when compared to God are not all that much different. Romans 3, 23, now verse 24. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And speaking to Christians, Paul says in the very next verse, and are justified freely by His grace. Or your Bible may say, justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So now as a Christian... When I come into Christ, how does God view me? We talk about two kinds of righteousness, really, and the Bible uses this term in both ways. One kind of righteousness is what I do. Do I live a righteous lifestyle? Do I practice righteousness? Do I have a habit of righteousness? That's about behavior, and it's very important. The Bible also talks about righteousness as being blessed to be in Christ and be forgiven. And if we envision our record, our file, our case with God, and when we stand before God and He pulls our record, He opens the books and, and there it is, what is our sentence? We want it to say, no sentence for you. No punishment for you. We want it to say, righteous by the blood of Christ. So now here's what happens. This is the way we are outside of Christ. What happens when we come into Christ Looks like this. Now when I talk about this, I want to be clear what I mean. I don't mean we become God. We don't become equal to God. We are not gods. We're not God. But on the scale of righteousness, when we put on Christ, when we stand before God, we are judged by Christ's righteousness. And you're either in Christ or you're not. And so when we put on Christ, our status with God is one of being a righteous person. Romans 3, 24, we are now justified. That word justified is a verb form of the word righteous. Righteousness is a noun. Righteous is an adjective. And to be justified is the verb form of that. It's being made righteous in the eyes of God. That's what we mean by justification. We have been justified by grace. Am I perfect on my own? Nope. Never have been. But in Christ, I am completely forgiven and made righteous, Paul says, by His grace as a gift. How? 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as an atoning sacrifice by His blood. That's why it's in red. God's the gold standard. I don't measure up on the gold standard. I measure up on the red standard because I'm in Christ. Now, having been found in Christ, and if I'm made righteous in Christ, then where does that leave me? Well, it leaves me needing to grow up in Christ. We were born when we were baptized. John chapter 3, verse 3, and again in verse 5, Jesus says you can't enter the kingdom of heaven unless you be born of water and the Spirit. And when we come into Christ, we're born, we're infants, and we've got some growing up to do. Is that right? Does a person have to know everything when they become a Christian? They have to have all the answers? They have to have all of their life straightened out? No, the Bible tells us that you have to have faith and repent, and then you can be baptized into Christ. And there's going to be some growing up to do. Now I want you to think about how many places in Scripture touch on what we've just illustrated here. Let's back up for just a second and think about this. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9 says, Speaking of Christ, that though He was rich, He became poor, so that we who are poor might become rich. This is the poor, and this is the rich. Jesus, speaking in the Sermon on the Mount, as He begins the Beatitudes, the first four Beatitudes, think about what Jesus says, beginning in Matthew 5 and verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger, hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's pretty hungry and thirsty right there, isn't it? For they shall be filled. When you think about also in the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 20, Jesus tells a parable of laborers in the vineyard. Anybody remember that story? Man was going to hire some temporary workers, agricultural workers to come work in his vineyard. It's harvest time and he needs some folks to come in and, and get the work done quickly. And so he goes out early in the morning, gets some people and brings them in. He goes out a third hour of the day, gets some more people and brings them in. Sixth hour of the day he goes out and brings in. Ninth hour of the day he goes out and brings more in. Finally at the eleventh hour, there's only an hour left to work in the day. And he goes out and gets more people. At the end of the day he pays them all and all get paid the same. Isn't that what this illustrates? Our debt is so great and God's grace is so great that this business of I was better than you loses its meaning. And our praise today has not been based on how good we've been. Our praise today has been based on how gracious God has been. The Bible's full of this discussion. In uh, the Gospel of Luke, for example, one of our favorite parables in Luke chapter 15 that parable that we call the parable of the prodigal son. But now you know it's not about just one son. It's about a father who had two sons. And you remember that story so well. But that younger son went and he wasted what he had. And the older son, he stayed home and worked. And when the younger son comes back, the father runs to him, embraces him, forgives him, and throws a party. Welcomes him back as a son. And the older brother who has been working all of this time, stays outside and doesn't want to come in. He's frustrated and angry. And the father comes out and pleads with him to come in. And the older brother says, all this time I've been working for you. And the word he uses for work there could be translated working like a slave for you. And you never gave me a party. And the father kind of scratches his head. I envision and says, son, everything I have is yours. What's going on in that story? Jesus is trying to correct the Pharisees and others who are criticizing him for being so gracious to sinners. And the younger brother comes to realize this is him. He comes to realize that he is in poverty in every way, including spiritually, and he goes to the father, and the father graciously forgives him. And when this happens, there is great rejoicing, even in the presence of God and in the angels in heaven, but not with the older brother. Why? What's wrong with the older brother? He's thinking like this. Isn't he thinking like this? Doesn't he see himself over here? I've worked all this time for you and he's been over there on the other side and he is wasted and he starts naming sins. He doesn't know. He's just conjecturing. In that parable, Jesus is trying to get people who think like this to think like this so that they can think like this. 
the places in the Bible where this, these comparisons occur, just, they're just everywhere. They go on. For example, in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, Paul there illustrating this point. He says, uh, when we were weak, when we were weak at just the right time, God gave his son on our behalf. And he said, you know, rarely for a good person, a righteous man would someone die, but maybe occasionally someone would do that. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then Paul goes on to say, if that was true when we were sinners, how much more then, now that we're in Christ, will God not just through his death redeem us, but through his life save us unto eternal life? If God loved me when I was his enemy and a sinner and ignoring him and doing just what I wanted, what does he, what does he think of me now? that I gladly renounce sin, although I still have to ask for forgiveness. And I believe in the message about His Son and in His Son. And I am obeying, I'm submitting to His will and to the best of my understanding and knowledge, I'm seeking to do all that God has commanded me to do. He loved me when I was a sinner. How does He feel about me now? And yes, I've got some growing up to do. Now let's think about some of the ways that this is especially relevant maybe for us today. Let me, can I share with you a couple of stories, real life stories? In the Estes congregation, we have a lot of college students, as you might imagine. They're a great blessing. You can't keep up with them. Trying to keep their name straight is just embarrassing, right? Because they, there are so many of them and they come and go. But it's pretty common for a, a young person about college age to respond to the invitation. And so when that happens, of course, they'll usually make a statement about, you know, I've not been the example I need to be. I haven't been saying and doing the things I should. And, and I just, I want to be dedicated. I want to be what I'm supposed to be. And I'm confident that in a loving congregation like this, you have young people, and I hope people of every age, whose consciences are tender and who think that way. And uh, my preaching buddy, Mark Blackwelder, he and I, we have a, a policy and uh, we don't think that people get everything said that they want to say on the front pew while everybody's watching and the singing is going on and so on. And they get their confession and we pray with them and then we encourage them to come by and sit down and talk. And we ask them to come and, and uh, we try to schedule a time and, and maybe it turns into two or three times sometimes to talk about what's really bothering them. So a young lady responds to the invitation, college age young lady. I happen to be the one... Uh, speaking, and so I handled the response and invited her to come by, and she made that kind of statement that so many people make, I've not been what I ought to be, and I, I want forgiveness, I want to do better. And uh, so I invited her to come to the office, and, and she did. She was so sweet and so gracious. And uh, so I just asked her, I said, tell me what was on your mind when you responded the other night. She said, well, I'm just not what I ought to be. And I said, I probed a little further. I mean, she can stop talking anytime she wants. I said, well, tell me what that means. Well, I don't uh, read my Bible as much as I should. And I don't pray like I should. And I don't do as much good as I should. And I said, well, let me, let me ask you, you know, um, are you involved in drugs and alcohol? Oh, no. Are you guilty of promiscuity? No, no. Have you, uh, are you gossiping? I know, you know, it's a, and no. And here's a very tender conscience who says, I'm not all that I should be and is uh, seeking to be that. And I'm, I am thankful for that tender conscience. But I, I'll just be honest with you. I want her to have peace. I want her to understand that all of us are seeking to grow. There's always more good that you could do. Now, I know we, we console ourselves sometimes by saying, I'm doing the best I can, or, or console each other, you're doing the best you can. I don't think I've ever done the best I can. 
And here's what I mean by that. There's always more good I could do. I could always seek out another Bible study, pray another prayer, spend another five minutes at the nursing home. I could always do that. And for this young lady, that sense of falling short was absolutely killing her soul. And so she was thinking kind of like this. And she saw herself maybe in the middle. And she was trying so hard and she just had no peace. And this kind of thinking is not only false, it is exhausting. I want us to be the best people we can be and so does the Lord. But he also has gone to great length inviting us to trust in him because we are imperfect and we fall short. What was Jesus' invitation in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30? What did he say? He said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you will find rest unto your souls. Now, in the middle of that comforting verse, Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. That means to submit to him, to not be the wild horse running free, but to be the broken horse hooked to a yoke. So I have to submit to him and trust in him and come to him. But in doing so, I receive grace. Second story, at the other end of life. That was a young lady about 20 years old we were just talking about. Let me tell you about my grandmother when she was about 70 years old. My grandmother was a matriarch of faith in our family. Maybe your family has a patriarch of faith. And I had a grandmother and a grandfather who were Christians. But, uh, you know, as they say, behind every great man is a great woman pushing, right? Okay. And so my grandmother was a person. She hadn't been a Christian. My grandfather probably never would have been a Christian. And my mother wouldn't have been. And then my father wouldn't have been. And I don't know, I might be living on the beach in Florida or something by now, right? And so I am thankful for her. And she was a person who was concerned about doing what was right. She was at church every time there was something going on at church that she could be at. She was cooking food and thinking about people and concerned about her children and grandchildren and their spiritual welfare. What a blessing. She suffered from cancer more than once in her life. And in her, around 70 years old, she was sick again and we didn't know how she lived for quite a while after that, but she didn't know, and we didn't know, and she was really thinking about what, what did she need to do to get her affairs in order. And uh, some of us trying to encourage her, you could see the worry in her brow as she thought about facing the Lord. And we talked with her about that, and here's what she said, summarized her hope in this way. I just hope I've done enough. She's thinking like this. She's done an awful lot, but she still struggled with the concept that I can trust in Christ. I do my good in Christ. I do my good because of Christ. Christ in me does good. And I'm seeking and growing. I'm not perfect. And that's exactly why God sent Christ. We need confidence in the grace of Christ. Satan is after us and he's looking for ways to stop us and trip us up and wear us out and cause us to stop before we get to the finish line. And over and over again in parables, in the words of our Lord, in the words of the epistles, over and over again, God is telling us that he knows that we need help. And he has made it this good. That if we put on Christ, we are righteous in his eyes. And then he says, now grow up into the fullness of Christ. A few years ago now, talking about this subject, using a similar set of illustrations, not exactly the same because this continues to grow as I try to grow and study. But um, in the place where I was preaching afterward, one of the elders uh, called me aside. He said, I want to talk to you for a minute. That's always exciting, by the way, after a sermon. 
you think, wow, this is going to be a moving sermon for somebody, right? And so he, he called me aside, and this was a gentleman well-respected, well-educated, a preacher in his own right, and now an elder, and, and loved, oh, loved by me and loved by everyone who knows him. He pulled me aside, and said, I'm just going to tell you what he said, and you meditate on it a little bit. First of all, he was complimentary. He appreciated the sermon. So that was a great, I didn't care what he said after that, right? I was great, re, greatly relieved. But then he said this, because I was emphasizing what Paul emphasizes, that righteousness here is a gift. Our standing with Christ is a gift. Are we supposed to obey? Yes. Does God expect us to be perfect? Apparently not. Does he want us to strive for perfection? Yes. Are you there yet? I don't think so. Well, how do I live with that? I'm not perfect, but I need to be perfect. You live it in Christ. So righteousness is a gift. So here's what my older brother said. Two statements. I don't think I'll ever forget them. He said, when I was coming up, you never heard a sermon on righteousness is a gift. It just wasn't on the list. I hope that's not your experience. But here's a venerable elder in a church telling me that's his experience. And I don't ever want to be guilty of being the one to preach in any location where that's not on the list. But I think I understand my grandmother's statement a little better. Maybe she was one who just hadn't gotten that message Maybe it hadn't been emphasized in her hearing. And it was so painful for her and for all around her. But what we marinate in all our lives long has a lot to do with what we are when we get to the end of our lives. And as she focused on her own weakness and strove so much to be everything that a Christian could be, she was very aware of her own weakness. One of the things, though, that our worship time does for us and our Bible study does for us is it invites us, urges us, and leads us not to focus just on ourselves, but to focus on Christ. I could not help but think when we sang a few minutes ago, It is well with my soul, that the person who thinks like this can never conscientiously sing that song. Because they're always wondering, well, you know, am I making the good enough grade? But a person who knows that on their own they're this and in Christ they're this can sing a verse we didn't sing of that song, the second verse. My sin, and then there's a pause there, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. Okay, come back to the thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole. Not in part, but the whole has been nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. What can you say? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Generally, as I talk to young people especially, but to other folks as well, they feel, they feel this way when they come up out of the baptistry. You remember that feeling? Have you ever had that conversation? You don't really mean it, but you sort of do mean it. You say, I wish, you know, I'd just been struck by lightning the minute I came up out of the water, right? And, and we have this sense that when we put our faith in Christ, we repent, we believe. We, well, it's Acts 2.38, right? What do we do? Here's what you do. Repent, right? Be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you receive the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit and the promises for you and for your children and for many as are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. In other words, that promise comes all the way down to us. And and we see that and it's very clear and we have a sense. I've obeyed, I've been washed, and I'm clean. And we have that sense really strongly when we obey the gospel, but we sort of drift back into this. After that, as I talked with the young lady that I described a minute ago, we read some scriptures and studied together over a period of 
more than once. I don't remember just how often we got together. And uh, we would read scriptures that talked about how Jesus responded to people. How many times does someone come to Jesus who is wrestling with spiritual matters and sin and what to do with Jesus? How many times did somebody come to him like that and Jesus just said, I don't believe you're going to measure up. You need to just go home. Did that ever happen? Well, but did it ever happen the other way? Did it ever happen that someone whose life was just infused with sin and everybody knew it and they had a bad reputation and even the Bible itself says was a sinner and they came to Jesus and Jesus said, go in peace. Your faith has made you whole. Did that ever happen? Now here's a young lady the kind of young lady, frankly, I would like for my son to meet, okay? And she is doing so much, and she is not at peace. And so we read some scriptures about how Jesus deals with people. I mean, Jesus says in John chapter 14, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So I'm so thankful for Jesus being here in the flesh because the Father scares me a little bit. I mean, he's the gold standard, right? And I see myself like this. And Jesus comes and shows us that God loves and welcomes and He just does it in the most vivid way ever done. God has been communicating that message, but here it is acted out right before our eyes by God in the flesh, Jesus. And so with this young lady, we read those stories and we, I, I say, see here how this woman comes in and she's crying and her tears are falling on Jesus' feet and she's so, so overwhelmed by her past and the presence of Jesus and she's wiping his feet with her hair and being judged by people in the room and Jesus says, go in peace. Now put yourself in that story. You be that woman. Wouldn't you feel about the same way? I'd just be glad to sit at his feet, wash his feet and the tears would just roll down. But Jesus doesn't want us to stay there. He doesn't want that woman to stay miserable. He doesn't want her to stay focused on herself. He wants her to go in peace. We could talk about Bible story after Bible story, and we did. We talked about several, this young lady and I, and it was interesting to watch as she would grasp that truth for the moment, and then she would say, yeah, but there's this, there's this voice in the back of my head that says, no, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't know if you, you might. That thought of grace, she was afraid, might lead her to be less obedient, might lead her to be less honoring and submissive to Christ. I want to challenge that idea. We're supposed to fear the Lord and fear Him in the right way, but we're also supposed to grow in love and perfect love cast out fear. I enjoyed listening to Bill Boyd here in the auditorium yesterday as he talked about marriage and how much it meant to him. And, and I think this, this statement I'm about to make relates to that. Will your marriage, that relationship, be healthier if what motivates you is the fear that if you don't do good, you're going to break up? Or will your marriage be healthier if you're motivated by love and joy and see it as a blessing? Do we need to be aware of the fear that it could... Yeah, there are times we get in trouble and, and maybe we're tempted by something awful that could really destroy our marriage. And we need to have fear at that time. But I, I hope that's not how we live in our marriages every day. I hope we live in love and in confidence in our relationship and in the desire to have joy and peace and happiness and, and be motivated by love and, and have fear only there when we most need it. Wouldn't that be... Wouldn't that be true of our relationship with God as well? That we're going to need fear sometimes. We need the fear put in us and there'll be times when temptation is so strong that maybe the only thing that'll keep us on the right path is saying, if I do this, I could lose my soul forever. But that's not the healthiest way to live every day. Our evangelism will be greater if we ourselves are experiencing peace and we invite other people into it. 
our worship will be more joyful if we know that in Christ we stand like this. Our own emotional and spiritual health will be more complete if we see ourselves as, yes, with growing to do. But I came into Christ when I became a Christian. And I have continued to walk in the light, which doesn't mean a perfect life apparently, because 1 John 1 says, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. So apparently a walk in the light is a walk of faith and devotion, but not perfection except in so much as the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. So when I think about my baptism, it wasn't just an event that washed my sins away, although it was that. It was a birth that made me a child of God. It was a death to serving self and a resurrection to a new life. It was being adopted into the family of God. And God, who loved me and provided for that adoption, even while I was still a sinner, still loves me and provides for me that I might walk by grace, that I might be found in Christ, that I might by faith look past my weaknesses and trust in His strength. His grace is sufficient for me. We could go on this morning with another hundred Bible verses that illustrate this very point. But I want to challenge you this morning. First of all, how do you think about Christ? If we go through life thinking about salvation based on ourselves rather than based on Christ, then we're going to be in trouble. But if we put our faith in Christ and by that commit ourselves to His service, we're going to be blessed and experience peace. God has spoken. And when He has spoken, He's spoken about our weakness and His power, our sin and His forgiveness. Is that relevant to you? Is it relevant to you this morning to think about trusting in Christ more and focusing on yourself less? Is it relevant to you this morning to think about not just saying, have I done enough, but being able to say, Christ has done enough and I'm trusting in Him. I am in Christ. Is it relevant to you this morning that in Romans chapter 6, Paul, who's still talking about this same topic, says, shall we go on in sin so that grace may abound? You know, now that we're in Christ, just, shall we just go on sinning because we're in Christ? And he says, God forbid. How shall we who died to sin live any longer therein? Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Is it relevant to you this morning that Paul would say you need to be baptized into his death? These blessings are found in Christ. Are you in Christ? What do you believe about that? What do you believe about Christ? Do you believe He died for your sins? Do you believe you're in Christ? Do you believe that you stand right now justified in the sight of God because of Christ? What do you really believe? Maybe you need to challenge your beliefs. Maybe you need to rethink the way you think about Christ. Or maybe knowing that you are outside of Christ, you need to come in. And so Jesus said, come. If you're weary and burdened, come. We're going to sing a song we call an invitation song or a song of encouragement. And its purpose is to encourage and invite. To invite you to come into Christ and receive God's gift of righteousness. Can we help you to study about that, to do that, to obey that, to receive that this morning? If we can, please come while we stand and together we sing.